cutting, the shape, and the quality. Hopefully the signing of this rubber sounds different than the previous two examples. That's because this is a dice solid rubber. Its shape, the crescendo, and what about its quality? I think many people would agree that it sounds glowing in nature. Let's listen again.
Therefore, I will be more stupid to put priority tribute here, which means more special place on rounds. So our number of assistant card numbers that have a name after the commission who first described them. I'm going to find it here. First, a new to late capable of dice-bomb bubble, heard in aortic crustacean, which can work on stenosis. That is the Austin for Murmur. Next, the phenomenon in which the highest frequency conference of an aortic stenosis number predates the apex, committing ultra crustacean. That is the Galapagos phenomenon. A number of pulmonary crustacean occurring in a setting of pulmonary hypertension. The grams feel murmur. A new dice-bomb murmur heard at the apex during acute rheumatic fever. Carrying Coombs murmur. And lastly, a dice-bomb murmur heard in stenosis of the left anterior descending artery. That's Fox murmur. I will leave you with one final point for you. The Austin for Rubber, Graham Steel Rubber, and the Carrie Cruz Rubber are, as far as I know, the only final physical findings in the body which contain the position of the rubbers, first and the last names. I hope you have found this lecture on hard both informative and useful. Please remember to like or share the video, or leave a comment if you have a question or feedback. If you haven't already discovered it, you may also enjoy liking any video on hard sounds. Activated factor 5 to form the probinase complex, which in turn converts a small amount of probin into probin. 
The illustrator is diagnosed once more. He very first reaction to the injury is data restriction, followed by fitness activation, which is largely mediated by exposure of collagen. Fitness activation results in a change in fitness shape. Fitness activation is mediated largely by one little factor, epinephrine, and results in a state of fog. The state of hemostasis is called primary hemostasis. The second phase of hemostasis is largely triggered by exposure of tissue factor or vascular injury, which triggers a coagulation cascade, the end result of which is flawless conversion of epinephrine to fiber. Fiber polymerizes generating fiber strands, which are superposed in the fog and trap red blood cells in one of one class. This is secondary hemostasis. There are many critical points in which the fitness and coagulation cascade rely on one another. In addition, there are important antibiotic control mechanisms which prevent both spontaneous intravascular coagulation as well as one-way coagulation in response to actual injury. And finally, the enzyme plasmin is responsible for cleavage of the fibrous strands and eventual clot degradation. That concludes part two of the normal physiology of hemostasis. If you found this video to be interesting and helpful, please remember to like it and share it with your colleagues and classmates. The next video in the series will discuss lab tests of hemostasis. Hey everyone, this is Eric again from Stanford University at the Palo Alto VA Hospital. This is the first video in a five-video series on sodium and potassium disorders, and the topic will be the normal physiology involved in sodium, potassium, and water balance. I personally really enjoy this topic, but I appreciate this may not be true for everyone. So my goal here is to make this video the last lecture on the topic we'll ever need, by explaining the content as clearly as possible, using plenty of diagrams, as well as making it thorough enough to include all the details you may need to know down the road. The maintenance of a healthy and stable balance of the concentrations of sodium and potassium, along with the appropriate amount of water in our bodies, is a classic example of homeostasis. Control of this particular homeostasis is a highly complicated process involving numerous interconnected physiologic pathways, dozens of enzymes, and over a dozen hormones. Fortunately, a complete understanding of all this is not necessary to the routine practice of medicine. However, a sufficient understanding or medical practice is still quite involved, and if you are coming into this video series already feeling overwhelmed by this topic, don't worry, that's very common. I found that sodium and potassium water homeostasis can be made more accessible by teaching it in layers, starting from a big picture without specifics, then moving to the details of individual pathways, and ending with returning to the big picture down with the details filled in. This is the learning process I'll be using here. I won't be turning you into the world expert in the physiology, but rather provide you all the necessary physiology background to allow you to diagnose and treat the vast majority of patients with disorders of sodium and potassium balance. The key players of sodium and potassium water homeostasis that I'm discussing can be broken down into three categories. There are three major hormones, seven minor hormones, and two critical enzymes. If it's not listed here, it's not going to be relevant. So let me start now with the big picture without details. This will represent the sodium and potassium water that is present in our blood. There are four arms or domains of physiologic processes that closely interact to keep these in balance. First is the GI system. We take any electrolytes and water in food. Some of this gets absorbed in the GI tract and some gets secreted. Whatever remains in the GI tract that either wasn't absorbed or was actively secreted is then expelled in the feces. The next arm is the renal system. The electrolytes in water and blood travel to the kidneys where they are freely and passively filtered through the pulmonary line, a process which I'll discuss slightly more detail later. The vast majority of filtered electrolytes in water get reabsorbed by the kidneys and re enter the circulation. The small fraction of dozens ends up in the urine. Next, we have the intracellular space. This is the relatively abstract fluid compartment composed of the sum of the interiors of every cell in the body. It's obviously not an organ system the way the GI and renal systems are, but still plays a critical role here because potassium and water experience transmembrane shifts in response to pathology. That is, certain disease states will trigger potassium or water to move into cells or out of cells. Now, any student who has had cell biology might say, wait a minute, sodium moves back and forth across cell membranes too. For example, you think with a sodium potassium ATP pump? Uh, that's definitely true, but all I'll say is that the arrangements of serum sodium levels are virtually never caused by the arrangements in the transmembrane shift of sodium, but they can certainly be caused by the arrangements in the transmembrane shift of water, which I'll discuss later. The final of the four arms is the endocrine system. If you're wondering, those things are meant to be your adrenal glands. The endocrine system acts by mediating or controlling other three systems using hormones. Hormones are substances in the body, usually steroids or polypeptides, that are released into the circulation by various different endocrine glands and which act at sites distant from where they are synthesized. This diagram represents homeostasis of sodium, potassium, and water in a nutshell. The next step in understanding all of this is to learn a little bit more about the details of the individual pathways involved. There are two specific pathways here that are important, which are known as axes. In physiology, an axis is a sequential set of direct influences and feedback mechanisms that link a collection of closely related endocrine glands and target organs. I'm not personally a fan of the term axis in this context, but it's so ingrained in the language of physiology that we're probably stuck with it. As far as electrolytes and water are concerned, the more important of the two is the median angiotensin aldosterone axis. The less important of the two in regards to the topic specifically is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. I'll talk about each. The median angiotensin aldosterone axis begins the liver with a constitutive production and release of a pre-hormone or hormone precursor called angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen is converted in the circulation to another pre-hormone called angiotensin 1. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme renin, which is held to secrete into the circulation by the kidneys in response to various stimuli, most notably decreased blood pressure in arteries that supply the kidney. Angiotensin 1 is then converted to the active hormone angiotensin 2. This is catalyzed by the angiotensin converting enzyme produced in multiple locations of the body, but primarily the lungs. Unlike reading, a clinically relevant stimulus for secretion of this enzyme is not well understood or described. Angiotensin 2 has many of its own actions, but one of them is in the adrenal glands, where it stimulates conversion of steroid precursors into another important hormone called aldosterone. So in summary, low blood pressure in the kidney results in secretion of renin, the ultimate result of which is increased levels of circulating angiotensin 2 and aldosterone. So what are the specific actions of these hormones in the kidney, where their direct effect on electrolyte balance occurs? Here's a schematic of the nephron, the basic functional unit of the kidney, of which each kidney has about a million. First, we have the blood supply, which originates in the renal artery and ends up in the apparent arterial. Some of the water and electrolytes will be freely filtered across the glomerulus, which is, in reality, a much more complex structure than the structure makes it appear. The portion of blood that is not filtered is taken away from the glomerulus via the deeper arterial. The electrolytes and water, among other compounds that are filtered, move next into the proximal convoluted tubule, where much of the sodium is reabsorbed along with bicarbonate ions, which maintain electrical neutrality. This process is stimulated by angiotensin 2. 
Returning to a course on Instagram, original take picture overview, you see that so far I've been getting all the individual details on integrated real systems. Now there's surprisingly nothing really to say about the GI system, and so we start talking about a couple of key elements of various technologies that will be reserved for future videos. However, the one topic that still deserves some detail at this point is the trans shift of water and potassium. Let's take a look at how these shifts actually work. Starting with water, I'm going to let this box schematically represent a typical cell. Inside the cell, I'll put some sodium ions. Not too many because the intercellular concentration of sodium is relatively low. And I'm putting a lot more sodium ions outside the cell. Then I'll add some potassium ions. This time, many more inside the cell to help. It's roughly how these ions are actually distributed in all cells. The difference in concentrations between the intracellular and extracellular components is a thing about that ubiquitous sodium potassium ATPH that I referred to earlier that pumps each of those ions against this electrochemical gradient. Let's suppose that we start off with a normal extracellular sodium concentration and normal pontonic pressure both inside the house. Let's further suppose that we have a patient who is diabetic and for some reason, maybe lack of medication compliance or maybe a new illness, his or her serum glucose starts to increase. Since glucose cannot be diffused across the cell membrane, if the rate of glucose formation exceeds the cell's capacity to uptake it, the concentration of glucose will start to increase. As it does so, we find ourselves in a situation in which there is a very high extracellular pontonic pressure, but still normal intracellular pontonic pressure. Since water is able to thin out of both cells relative ease, this pontonic pressure gradient immediately disappears. That is, high pontonic pressure sort of pulls water towards it from the intracellular space to the extracellular space. As this occurs, the cell literally shrinks, and so the pontonic pressure in both spaces or compartments is the same. Now, what happens to the extracellular sodium concentration, which is equal to the serum sodium? We have the same number of sodium ions as before, but now they are in a greater amount of water. Therefore, our previously normal serum sodium concentration has become abnormally low. To generalize this process, whenever the body produces or is given an excessive amount of an extracellular solute that lacks the ability to be rapidly taken up by cells, for example, glucose, or a drug called banasol, the consequence is low serum sodium, a specific situation called hypertonic hypoglycemia. The word hypertonic refers to the fact that the total solute concentration in the extracellular fluid is higher than normal. Next, I'll review transmembrane shifts of potassium. In this case, instead of sodium being other ions of interest, it's actually the hydrogen ion. In every cell, even if it's completely normal has phase status, there are free hydrogen ions floating around, just as there are hydrogen ions loose in the extracellular space. Usually, the hydrogen ion concentration is relatively low, but water starts to increase. Proxies that could do this include severe hydration or infections, which ultimately leads to a conversion in cells from anaerobic oxygen required respiration to anaerobic or oxygen free respiration. A consequence of anaerobic respiration is the accumulation of lactic acid as a byproduct. This acid is released into the circulation at a rate greater than that at which the body can clear it. The result is the accumulation of hydrogen ions and a decrease in serum pH, a situation called acid media. These excess extracellular hydrogen ions shift the equilibrium covering their concentration, which begins to rise up into the intracellular space. However, to maintain electrical neutrality, the passive ions shift outward. The exact details of how this process works is not going to be all this. Mm. But um, while this transmembrane exchange may help the blood take critical decrease in serum pH, it's also at the expense of causing a high serum passive concentration known as hyperkalemia. So in summary, acidemia leads to blood of hyperkalemia. By the converse of the mechanism, alkalemia can lead to a very modest hypokalemia. In addition to acid-based services, a few other factors can lead to transmembrane shifts of the passive. So exercise and treatment of beta blockers class medications can lead to hyperkalemia. And insulin and activation of beta 2 receptors by circulating catecholamines like epinephrine can lead to hypokalemia. Going back to the overview of the structure of this video's content, I've covered the big picture without the details, then the individual pathway separately with the details, and now I'll conclude by putting those small details back into the big picture. The next two diagrams will synthesize everything we've learned so far. So let me review the actions of the foremost involved in sodium potassium water homeostasis. The first step is that sodium potassium water is absorbed by the GI tract and finds a way into the blood. The blood is cycled through the kidneys, a significant portion of that sodium potassium water is pretty filtered through the very line. So a portion of each of those will be reabsorbed in the tubules and collecting ducts. Antifectin 2 and aldosterone both directly stimulate the absorption of sodium and indirectly the absorption of water. Aldosterone prevents the absorption of potassium. AKH strongly encourages resorption of water without directly affecting the resorption of the others. And AMP and DMP block the resorption of sodium and thus indirectly prevent the resorption of water. In other words, AMP and DMP antagonize the RA axis and ADH as part of the checks and balances to prevent excessive resorption and excessive volume expansion. Although not relevant at physiologic levels, the path will be elevated for the salt identical effects at the And any sodium potassium or water that is not resorbed gets eliminated in the urine. In this hormone action in the kidneys, some other hormones can specifically impact potassium shifts between the blood and intracellular space. Specifically, insulin and catecholines like epinephrine drive potassium from the extracellular space like blood to the intracellular space. The major end effects of the system are as follows. Antifectin 2 promotes increased intravascular volume and thus increased blood pressure. Aldosterone also promotes increased intravascular volume and blood pressure, as well as decreasing serum potassium. And ADH promotes increased volume and pressure while decreasing sodium. For reasons difficult to concisely explain, pathologic abnormalities of ADH tend to impact serum sodium to a much greater degree than they impact volume and blood pressure. In other words, patients with unusually elevated levels of ADH are often developed symptoms of low sodium without developing over edema or significant hypertension. And a converse holds true for patients with unusually low levels of ADH or resistance to ADH. I'll discuss both of those scenarios in more depth in the videos on hyper and hypoglycemia. If you had to pick one screenshot in this video to memorize, I would probably make it this one. For the second of the two separate diagrams, I review the hormonal regulation of intravascular volume and blood pressure from an anatomic and more complete perspective. This will be a natural session of the last diagram. As we've seen, regulation of the volume and blood pressure in the body is an incredibly complex process that involves most of the uh, body's organs. The key players are the kidney, the hypothalamus, the anterior and posterior pituitary glands, the adrenals, and the blood vessels. However, the liver, lungs, and heart all play a role as well. So, how are all these anatomically distinct structures linked? Let's imagine the physiologic arrangement of low systemic blood pressure, which necessarily results in low renal perfusion pressure. This triggers the structure of regular cells in kidney for these reasons. Reading converts to pre-cortical angiotensinogen produced by the liver to angiotensin 1. This is then converted to the active cortical angiotensin 2 by the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme, which itself is primarily produced in the lungs. Simultaneous to that, TRH produced by the hypothalamus under the influence of physiologic and emotional stress promotes release of ACTH in the anterior pituitary, which is travels to the adrenals. And the adrenal glands ACTH stimulates the conversion of various steroid precursors, both to aldosterone as well as cortisol. Another major action of angiotensin 2 is to further stimulate the production of aldosterone specifically. Now, angiotensin 2 and aldosterone together, along with cortisol and pathologic excess, have complex actions in the kidney, in the proximal and distal respectively. The most 
the results of those actions are sodium resorption caused by both. By carb resorption caused by antidepressant 2, and potassium and hydrogen ions deficient by aldosterone. The last of three of those four actions lead to hypokinesia and a metabolic apoptosis, which are often incidental to the major consequence of the sodium reabsorption, which is the accumulation of water reabsorption. Water reabsorption expands in intravascular volume and helps increase blood pressure. Antidepressant 2 also directly stimulates the restriction, which further increases blood pressure. Now, another aspect of blood pressure regulation deals with ADH. ADH release is primarily stimulated by elevated serum osmolarity, which can be seen in some forms of dehydration, though low blood pressure also directs stimulus as well. ADH promotes water reabsorption as well as beta restriction. At this point, you may be thinking, well, it looks really complicated. But I'm not quite done. There are still some examples of negative feedback mentioned that is a couple of checks and balances. First, and most importantly, the improved blood pressure that is the end result of this process leads to inhibition of renewal release. Another form of negative feedback is that the increase in blood pressure, along with increased intravascular volume, together lead to increased intracardiac pressure. This is the case for heart to release NP and DMP. And NP and DMP block many of the actions of the RA system in the kidneys, as well as induce basal dilation. Finally, cortisol, though usually plays only a very minor role here, does inhibit both APTH and CRH release. So there it is, as a complete and summary of hormonal control of volume of blood pressure that you ever likely need to know as a practicing clinician. If you can reproduce this, you have likely mastered this topic. There's one final thing I'd like to discuss very briefly here because we'll make certain issues in the subsequent videos on sodium and potassium easier to understand, and that is the types of action of various diuretics. And diuretic is any substance that promotes formation of urine, usually through inhibiting resorption of sodium in the tubules, which increases the tubular luminal osmotic pressure and thus prevents water reabsorption. So here's the network again that we saw earlier. Each place along the network where salt or water is reabsorbed has its own class of diuretic. In the proximal tubule, carbonic and hydrate inhibitors such as acetazolamide block here. The same extending limits where loop diuretics such as pyrozolamide and pyrozolamide pack. The five by diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide and polizone happen in the distal convolute tubule. And the so-called potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone block sodium reabsorption in the principal cells. In addition to that, the directly block sodium reabsorption, there are uncommonly used ADH antagonists that directly prevent reabsorption of water. And for the sake of completeness, metabolic is a unique diuretic that promotes water loss in the urine by acting as an osmotically active substance in the tubular fluid. So that's about it. That's our complete overview of how the human body normally maintains all the phases of sodium, potassium, and water. I know it may have seemed unusually thorough, but I hope by providing all the background to be all necessary to understand the main disorders of sodium and potassium imbalance. Feel free to ask any questions or sharing thoughts in the comment section. The subsequent four videos in the series will cover hyponatremia, hyperlatremia, hypokinemia, and hyperkinemia.